Lake Institute fosters a deeper understanding of the ways in which faith inspires and informs giving through research, education, and training. Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. Welcome to Faith in Focus. We're so excited that you're here. This show is all about faith, what faith means to you and how you live your faith every day. In this month's episode, we'll hear from Colleen Dully, one of the hosts of the Inside the Vatican podcast about the Vatican's plans for responding to sexual abuse. Then we'll have our interview with the journalist Krista Tippett, who brings enlightening spiritual conversations to thousands of Americans every week on her wonderful public radio show, On Being. In our People of God segment, we'll hear from Becca, a volunteer at L'Arche Atlanta, about her experiences living in community with people with disabilities. And in our Life in the Spirit segment, we'll reflect on what ordinary time teaches us about finding God in everyday life. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy this episode of Faith in Focus. This week, the USA Northeast Province of Jesuits released the names of Jesuits who were removed from ministry because of credible accusations of sex abuse and against whom there were credible accusations since 1950. The Northeast Province is the final U.S. province to release its list of names. In other words, as of this month, every Jesuit province in the United States has released their names. Other dioceses and religious orders have done the same thing in the last few months. It is the right and moral thing to do, and a necessary step toward not only combating sex abuse, but also moving ahead in the process of confession and reconciliation. But it's also a wrenching moment for me, since I am a member of this province. I knew several of those men after they were removed from ministry. Now, I was never their superiors, nor did I have any authority over them, but it is still something that fills me with shame and also anger at their crimes and sins. But the worst moment for our province was not the day of the release of names. The worst moments for our province were the days when these men committed their abuses. I pray that the release of names will be a step in the change that must happen around this issue. It is the most important thing the church can do today. Another step toward that change is that next month, the presidents of bishops' conferences from countries around the world will meet at the Vatican to discuss solutions to the abuse crisis. Here to tell us what they have planned is Colleen Dully, the producer of Faith and Focus and co-host of Inside the Vatican podcast. Welcome to the show, Colleen. Thanks for having me, Jim. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to happen at the summit? Sure. So the meeting is only four days long, but the organizers have said that they see the summit as more of a starting point to get all the bishops on the same page about abuse. Because right now there are big disparities in how different dioceses and religious orders around the world are handling it. So one big part of this meeting is going to involve the bishops listening to abuse survivors. And this will happen in their general listening sessions, but also in a penitential liturgy that Pope Francis himself requested. So critics often say that church leaders need to spend more time on action and less on prayer, but for Catholics, this spiritual component is really important. That's right. The spiritual component is not only important, but essential. Our lives are grounded in God, and even if we need to act, we need to be reminded of our fundamental reliance on God, and prayer really helps us with that. Right, exactly. And between these listening sessions with the survivors, the bishops will also be working together in language groups to come up with resolutions. Now, these might not end up being very specific. We've seen throughout Pope Francis's pontificate that he often tries to give bishops a lot of freedom to decide what's going to work best in their specific situations and their specific cultures. The big question with this summit is whether it's going to make a lasting difference. And the answer to that will depend entirely on how well the bishops and the heads of religious orders who attend the meeting end up following through on it. Thanks, Colleen, for coming. Colleen will be in Rome covering the summit, and uh, she'll be covering it for her podcast, Inside the Vatican. And how can we find that podcast? You can listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Great. Thank you so much, Colleen, and thanks for joining us. Thank you for joining us for Faith and Focus. You can help us continue to have these important and open conversations about how faith touches our everyday lives at americamag.org slash donate. 
Krista and I first uh, knew of each other when I was teaching and she was studying at uh, Yale Divinity School in seminary. And it wasn't really until 11 years ago that um, we had the opportunity, even though we knew a lot about each other and we knew we shared a lot in common, to sit down and have a conversation. And from the beginning of that conversation, it was like meeting a long lost sister. Part of that um, immediate connection is that we're both from small towns in Oklahoma. And there's something about the commitments and personality and view of the world that happens when you grow up on those flat plains with that big sky uh, in these big oaky families that shapes you forever. You grow up in a, a small world. Krista wanted more than that. Um, and she left that world and made her way to Brown and then on into the world of journalism. But she, because of that journey, has both a deep appreciation for worlds that are rural and small and may seem close-minded to many people in the United States, because that's where she came from. And she can be critical of it and yet deeply understanding of it. So she's so good in her program of understanding the limits of what we know, where those limits come from, how we can be critical of them, and how that makes us better. Krista, when it comes to talking about issues related to uh, racism and white supremacy, asks people about their own experiences and is willing to push people on these issues. Uh, she's not afraid of the wounds that we hold and allowing people to see them and then to think about what healing them means. And we all have the wounds in us. And those wounds are the source of a lot of meaning. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. On Being is a show that everyone, with an ounce of sense in their head and less than an inch of spirituality in their bones, should watch. Should, you can't watch it, should listen to but Krista Tippett, who is, in my mind, the best interviewer in the United States today, um, invites great minds, great hearts, great spirits, great thinkers, and she asks them about the meaning of life and has the most amazing conversations there are. If you know Krista, you know that when she is creating that program, she is being herself. At the core of Krista is a profound belief that we are called to love each other. And that love is the truest thing there is about the universe and our relationship to one another. And it's out of that love that comes the compassion, the curiosity, that wicked smartness. I mean, she is so smart. And that sort of cleverness to find a, a turn in people that they might themselves not even know with respect to their own thinking. For Krista, all that is, it springs from that place of, of a sense of abiding love. This month, I'm excited to welcome the brilliant public radio host, journalist, and former diplomat, Krista Tippett. Krista's program, On Being, has brought thoughtful conversations to more than 400 radio stations about life's big questions for 15 years and is one of my favorite shows, and I bet it's one of yours. Welcome to Faith and Focus, Krista. Very glad to be with you. Thanks for uh, making time for us. Can you tell us a little bit about the genesis of On Being? Yeah, so I actually had been a journalist in divided Berlin in wow. a world that has now passed mm -hmm. and was very political, was very committed in a real 20th century way to political questions being the interesting questions and political so solutions being the meaningful solutions. And I, I ended up being a um, chief aide to our ambassador to West Germany and seeing high politics up very close and becoming disillusioned of that conviction about that, th that, that this was the realm where the truly interesting questions were being asked. And I ended up studying theology coming out of that when going to divinity school because I it was very surprising to me that that's the turn it took, but that's the turn it took. And so I went to Divinity School. I got an MDiv, and I came out in the mid-90s, and it was the era of um, 
Yeah, where you basically had Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson speaking for all, not just all Christians, but all religious people, and my fellow journalists happily giving them the microphone because they made for great sound bites. Sure. And I just felt like there was this huge vacuum where we, where we weren't able in public to speak about this, not just about religion, but this entire aspect of ourselves. And um, so that was the idea for, for, for this show. And initially it was called Speaking of Faith. I remember. And religion was in the headlines a lot in those days. It was the pre-9-11 pre years and then in a different way after 9-11. And then I feel like the show has kind of, I mean, I feel like our cultural encounter with religion and spirituality and these questions has been very, has evolved very rapidly in these years. And I, I, I like to think that the show has evolved along with them. Um, How has it changed your own life, the hosting the show, your own spiritual life, I would say? How has it changed it? I, I think that's a hard question to answer because it's hard to separate how my spiritual life has evolved because of the life I was living, you know, being a mother, um, being a citizen at this, you know, being a, I'm going through a divorce. Um, I don't know, just having the life passages that people, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'd probably be, probably be easier for me to talk about how life with my children affected me spiritually. I often feel like I have a conversation just at a moment where you know, where it touches something or where I'm able to take it in mm. because of what's happening in my life. Um, where you need it. Where maybe. I need yeah. it, yeah. So some, I have, there have been, there have been interviews across the years that I kind of almost treated like a therapy session. <laughs> or a spiritual direction. <laughs> or a spiritual direction, right, yeah. yeah. And I have been aware of that at times. You talked about your children. How have your children influenced your spiritual life since you brought it up? Your spiritual growth, would you say? yeah. Well, I got pregnant with my daughter when I was at seminary, which was a really interesting experience. So that process of becoming a mother and bringing a new life into the world was interwoven with my theological studies and my biblical studies. And, you know, so I'm reading something like Jesus talking about uh, be humble like a little child, right. you know, which honestly is one of those verses that never made much sense to me. Like, what do you get from being humble well, like a little child? Also, which child, right? Yeah. I mean, which child? Right. Um, or, you know, love. Mm -hmm. um, or learning that the root word for compassion in the Hebrew is, comes from the word for womb. Mm -hmm. um, it gave me this really beautiful lens on a mm. lot of that, that I then, I think, continued. I think I took that into my children's childhood. I mean, with humility, that's one that's important to me. I, yeah, that humility of a little child, I just like, you know, great, but that's not going to get me anywhere. <laughs> um, but I just remember this, I had this one day or my daughter was very young and I had a place to go. And instead of getting where I wanted us to go, I was with her. It took us half an hour just to get one block because she was absorbed in every creature, every bird, mm -hmm. every person that walked by, just amazed at all of it. And I realized that that's what Jesus was talking about and that mm -hmm. humility, that spiritual humility, because we think of it culturally as debasing yourself, right? Making yourself small, making yourself vulnerable, perhaps making yourself unsafe. Mm -hmm. But the spirituality of it, the humility of a child is about approaching everything with a readiness to be amazed mm -hmm. and a willingness to be surprised and kind of opening a space for others to be big rather than mm -hmm. for you to be small. So I, I found it, I found, I found parenting very theologically rich. That's beautiful. I mean, the sense of awe too. Awe, yes. wonder, curiosity. Yes, I think awe and humility are connected rather than humility and yeah, again, this I think we have this notion of debasement. Mm -hmm. um, has your image of God changed over the years or through the show, would you say? Because I'm, I'm always thinking about you in, uh, interviewing people from all sorts of faith traditions and mm -hmm. Buddhism and Hinduism. And it, Does it deepen it or open it up or what would you say? I, I, I do think that something that was missing in the church of my childhood that's so important for me now, also in my sense of God, is a real reverence for mystery. Hmm. 
and a real delight in mystery. And I actually think that mystery is an orthodox, it's like the heart of orthodoxy, right? Sure. And it, it's, and, and I think, you know, the, the, the existence of religious others is perhaps one of the most mysterious things. Mm -hmm. um, because our traditions do have exclusive truth claims, and yet they all ask us at their orthodox hearts to honor the fact that there are things we will not see, we will not understand in this lifetime. And I love, I love living in that creative tension. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and that, uh, as I think Thomas Aquinas said, if you can define it, it's not God anyway. Yeah. And so yeah. it's all. Um, has your prayer changed over the years? It's an interesting question. Yes. Um, Okay, I grew up very much kind of free-form prayer. I was really grateful when I discovered, when I went to the Church of England to discover, to discover the prayer book, mm -hmm. right? Liturgy. I didn't really know liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, I came to this you know, wonderful appreciation of praying words that others had prayed mm -hmm. before me mm -hmm. for thousands of years. Um, and I've and across the years I've I've prayed in different ways. I kind of feel like I mean I do think prayer I think prayer has something to do with personality type. Sure. You know? Yeah. And I also think prayer changes with the place you you are in life. So so there was a long period where I where I I used Compline, where I prayed Compline every night. And you know that was when my children were young and and I was building my project and it was really hard and there was a lot that I was fearful about and kind of cleaving to those prayers and it, so much of the psalms are in there mm -hmm. kind of just giving my fear and my anxiety a place to rest like bringing it before God yeah it makes sense you would want something that's more formal if was you more for are a container yeah yeah a moment when life felt so chaotic yeah. yeah and you don't want something that's more free form when your life feels free form yeah yeah, yeah. and I actually wrote a prayer a couple of years ago, which I never done before, which I've, which I have prayed every day for a couple of years, and I worked at it. I it started almost like a poem, mm -hmm. and and I worked on it the way I would work on another piece of writing. I wrote it. I you know rewrote sure. it. I prayed it. I changed the words, mm -hmm. and then I finally it settled. And it's about, I mean, it's, I kind of make the moves that a that a good prayer makes. I mean, there's some. There's some atonement and, and there's praise, praise and, gratitude. and and there's, you know, my desire. Um, it's about, I kind of realized in midlife um, how much I long to kind of walk through the world with an open heart. Mm. And I think people might see my work and think, oh, that comes naturally to me. But, you know, I'm a person. And <laughs> I have my wounds. <laughs> right. And I think my work is a way that I... Um, I think a, my work has been a way that I tried to do that, but I have found it to be really important to be also to like put that into prayer, right? And to sure. make it as an intention before God every day. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that Karen Armstrong, who I love, uh, that um, insight, my work is my prayer, can be very fulfilling because you work prayerfully. Uh, but sort of taken the wrong way, it can kind of exempt you from the yes. uh, one-on-one -on -one time with God. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, what do you hope people take away from your show? Is there a, do you have a goal for the series or for each show, would you say? I feel, I think the people who listen to On Being, and there's such a beautiful mix of people, and they're not, I love it that in our media space, they're thinking about meaning together. These are not people who necessarily are finding it easy or possible to be together in physical spaces right now. I, where I, the way I feel about the world right now is that there is this story of our time that is real of decay and chaos and division, division, you know, and then there's this other story of our time right at the same time, this generative narrative of good people, good projects, people who are creating the new realities that we want to inhabit. Um, and I, and I feel like the people who, live, who are in our media space are those people. And they're really, they're all different. It's all different kinds of people. They're Democrats and Republicans and men and women and all colors. And they live in, diff, you know, in all rural and urban and all these ways we think we're so divided. 
And so I think what happens, what I've experienced, it happens, and it just thrills me, is that people say, you know, I listen to the show and I feel less alone. Mm. That they feel accompanied in this redemptive way of being present to this world we inhabit and this moment. And I think, you know, if I had had some kind of goal, I, I wouldn't have dared hope for that, you know? That's beautiful. Yeah, that, that Thomas Merton quote, um, I had it over my desk for a long time, do not depend on the hope of results. Just as great. So thank you for, on behalf of all your listeners, for uh, all the great work you've done in creating that community mm -hmm. and helping people find meaning uh, in this difficult world. We're very happy to have you here. Um, you can find On Being on many local public radio stations and on Apple Podcasts. Up next, we'll hear from Becca about her experiences of living and working with disabled people at L'Arche, Atlanta. Today on People of God, we're talking to Becca Van Galder. Becca is a live-in assistant at L'Arche, Atlanta. Becca and I met during a recent talk I gave at St. Thomas More Parish, the Jesuit parish in Atlanta. And I was so impressed with Becca and her amazing ministry that I asked her to share her story with us on People of God. Welcome to Faith and Focus, Becca. Thank you so much, Father. I'm happy to be here. Nice to see you again. Uh, can you tell you. us a little bit about L'Arche? Uh, many people may not be familiar with L'Arche and just what it is and, and what you do there. So L'Arche is an international federation of communities of people with and without disabilities who share life together. Um, so that basically just means that I live in a house with four people with disabilities. We call them core members. And we just do life together. We go to the gym, we have meals, we um, pray together, all of the things that people do in a normal community. That's beautiful. Now, you mentioned uh, spirituality is an important part of uh, L'Arche uh, in your community. And you had an experience recently that uh, kind of showed you God's hand. Do, do you want to share it with us? Uh, my grandfather was sick for a few weeks and then passed away um, in March of this past year. And I wasn't quite sure how to grieve while in community, particularly um, since I was living with people that I often um, am a caregiver in a caregiver role with them. And so I was a little bit nervous to welcome them into my pain and welcome them into my grief um, because I wasn't sure how they would respond. And I also wasn't sure how that would change our relationships. Um, but they actually really taught me a lot about how to um, be with someone when they're in pain. So each of my housemates in their own way supported me. My friend Patrick uh, shared with me his own stories of grief. Corbin, who plays the bagpipes, um, played Amazing Grace for my grandfather on his bagpipe chanter. Um, John prayed for my family every single night. And um, Terry used to just come and give me little kisses on the back of my shoulder whenever he felt like I was feeling sad. And, it was just a really incredible um, experience in people seeing one another um, for exactly how they're feeling and, and doing whatever they can to connect in those times. That's so beautiful. And it's, uh, it is, again, this idea of God meeting us where we are, right? And, and mm. they met you where you were. And in a sense, God ministered uh, to you through them in the way that they could do it. Did Absolutely. It, did yeah. it teach you anything about uh, God's activity in your life? Did, do, you, do you come away uh, from that experience with the new understanding of how God works, would you say? Um, I would say it, it taught me a lot about um, God's love and how we are beloved in God's eyes. And it doesn't have to be silly times and laughter um, that we are worth loving. And even in the moments when it feels... Um, like we're not worthy of love or feels like we're being a burden on somebody else, um, that, that God is there for us through other people and, and that that love will show through. Well, Becca, thank you so much for sharing the stories about your ministry, your spirituality, and just your experience at L'Arche. We wish you all the best from Faith and Focus. Thank you, Father. To share a story about how God touched your life, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. As you can see, we've stepped out of the studio and we're here in my Jesuit community, America House in New York City, for a segment we're calling Life in the Spirit, where we'll talk about the spiritual life, your spiritual life. After Advent, after Christmas, after Epiphany, after the baptism of our Lord, we are back in ordinary time. 
For many of us who live in northern parts of the world, that can mean a return to a kind of cold, dreary time of year. But no matter where you live, ordinary time can seem like something of a slog, the ordinary. Boring, right? Well, remember that for most of Jesus' life, between the ages of 12 and 30, he lived an ordinary life. It's often called the hidden life. It's hidden because there's nothing written about those 18 years in the Gospels other than to say that Jesus was a carpenter. The New Testament scholar John Meyer, in his multi-book series, A Marginal Jew, writes about this hidden life. He asks the question why the Gospel writers didn't write more about it. And he concludes that not only were the Gospel writers more concerned with Jesus' public ministry, but for another reason as well, not a whole lot happened. Jesus' life was, in Father Meyer's words, insufferably ordinary. And yet in Jesus' ordinary life, some extraordinary things happened. He learned about love, about family, and about hard work. So one question to consider might be this. Where in your ordinary life do you see extraordinary signs of God's presence? And if you're looking for ways to find out where God is active in your ordinary life in extraordinary ways, why not check out America Media's Daily Examine podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Faith and Focus. To learn more about the show and share your story, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. We'll have a new episode next month with the longtime journalist and popular host of CBS This Morning, John Dickerson. See you there. Thank you for watching Faith in Focus. You can find more videos like this on our YouTube channel and subscribe so you never miss an episode. To learn more about how you can have your story featured on the show, visit americamag.org slash faithshow.